you study political science and economics. Yes. All right. So this whole philanthropy in action course, how, see how I can phrase this question. How did, how did you, how did you first become interested in it? And when, when did you start to dissect it in such a way where you start to realize, wow, there is, there is, there is more to, to philanthropy and, and, and you need to break it down in such a way that you can offer it or you can teach it to others. When did you first start, you know, looking at philanthropy in such an interesting or intriguing way? <clears throat> well, I can, I can actually tell you the moment. Mm -hmm. I was, oops, sorry. I was the, um, the deputy director of <coughs> a legal services program um, in New Jersey um, when Bill Clinton was president and Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House, and they, they did dramatic cuts to legal aid. That, and we lost more than a third of our budget because of those cuts. Um, and the only way we could survive was to either lay off staff, take pay cuts, or raise money. Um, and I think that wake-up call that for people who are doing such good work, in my view, some of the most important work on dealing with the world's most challenging problems, you had to have the ability to attract funding. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was in my early 20s. Uh, from that moment, uh, I realized that I had a, a dual a track as I thought of things, not only being a lawyer then or being an advocate, but also on a parallel track, how do you raise funding so that that would enable you to do the things you, you want to do. Um, as, as I got older, the, the matrix changed. I became more of an enabler in which, in which I became the person raising uh, more of the funding that allowed other people to, to function. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the complicated dynamics of social justice, but I think even of American politics or politics anywhere, is the ability to raise the funding so that you can do it. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that, was my, that, that was sort of my wake-up call and my early um, epiphany. Later on, um, given the horrific disparity in wealth, has evolved in the United States and around the world. Um, you know, the, the famous French economist Piketty talks about, talks about it. You see that we have people uh, worth billions of dollars um, within an economy of which they give very little uh, back, and people who are living in dire poverty with little access to education or health care. Um, but that's the, that's the dynamic. We have a very um, uh, capitalist mode of, of philanthropy. And, and so to, to grapple with this moment of great wealth, but also great uh, inequality, uh, I, I, I took it upon myself to begin to, to understand and become a scholar of that phenomenon so that I could help enable organizations and people to do good things by, by giving them access to very wealthy people and institutions, because otherwise um, they couldn't get the job done that they're seeking to do. I am curious. I'm curious about one thing. I mean, I've always been curious about this. Here is a large amount on one side of the, the fence or the, 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 the chasm, there is a large amount of wealth. And then on the other side, there is this deep, wide need. Um, <clears throat> is it that those that have the wealth, the money, don't really want to give, or they'd want to give, but those who need have to master the way of asking? I think it's, I think it's very complicated. Mm. I think 
I think it's it's that and a lot more. Um, I think we have a world order that is incredibly unequal. Um, we have societies that are incredibly unequal. Even countries like Guyana, um, during the time of its claim to socialism, was incredibly unequal. Yes. And this this inequality is exacerbated in a, in, in a country like the United States or in the EU and in other parts of, of the globe. Um, we have yet to figure out how to um, create a community chest, a, a way in which we, we lower that disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Um, there are people who believe fervently that they are, they are you know, destined by God to have that wealth. I don't believe that at all. Mm. And so they're not committed uh, to doing anything other than accumulating capital. There are those who do believe that, they're, that they are destined by God to great wealth, but they will give back some of that wealth. And there are those who believe that, um, that they should work to create greater, greater equality so that, so that um, there's a more evenly divided um, share of the pie. Uh, I think each of those pieces <coughs> has its own dynamics. Um, for my little part in it, um, I cannot fix the entire global world order. But what I can do is help facilitate um, people who want to give, convince them to give because they have the capacity uh, to give and, and give and give in large amounts. Um, to, to meet with and collaborate and share and guide and partner with, with, with people who have visions of, uh, and, and skills of, of doing great things, whether it's in healthcare or in, in, moving, in social movements or in scientific research or education or in the arts. <clears throat> and bringing those bodies together, I think, is my little way of, of helping use my skills to do that but i think the world needs a lot a lot more <clears throat> dramatic shifts in in culture because i do not believe we have um the kind of country or world that that, that, that is just where people are accumulating the kind of wealth at the top and and there's a level of of, of disenfranchisement marginalization hunger, starvation, and, and lack of education at the bottom. It makes no sense in the United States, and it doesn't make any sense around the globe. You know, Maxim, I'm listening to you, and, and if I may put in my two cents, um, that's a very necessary and powerful skill, however rare. But do you think, do you think that, um, or was one of your goals in offering this course, studying it and then offering this course, was to sort of replicate, n not to be presumptuous to say yourself, but to replicate the, the, the skill? In, in, in many others? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> that, would be, uh, that, that would be fun. I certainly, um, I certainly w wanted to equip my students with, with, with whatever skills that I have. Uh -huh. um, um, because I, I, I think it, in a modern world, that you have the disparity, you have to develop uh, the skill to navigate between these various worlds of, of inequity. Um, I wanted to help them uh, do that and teach them at least some of the craft and trade of, of doing that. Um, but I also wanted to, them to find themselves uh, because, because you know, one, of the, one of the things that you learn from young people and certainly from young people at Yale is they're a lot smarter than I ever was and, uh, or I am. Mm. And so I would hardly pretend to know the answer to some of the complex questions that you have asked me. I think some of them know and have answers that are far better than I will ever have. And so it was to give them the, help them find the questions that only they can answer yes. and they can answer for their generation and for generations going forward. Uh, th that to me was my ambition, not to 
pretend to have the answers for them. Gotcha. You know, you know, Maxim, I'm, I'm, I, there, I have a dilemma here. One is that uh, it's probably a little bit disingenuous. I, I should take a break, but I hardly want to take a break because the, there's so much to talk to you about, and the conversation is so interesting. So pardon me if I don't rush to a break. And secondly, I want to, to, to ask you here live, uh, Maxim, if at times you could come back on our Sunday afternoon show and share some of this, um, this amazing knowledge you have, especially on philanthropy, because I think there's so much to talk about. But I want to speak to you on your advocacy um, or for to, on funding, what is it, a new way to fund justice. What exactly do you mean and, and what are some ways you see this happening? When you look at the power of the Obama campaign, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, Barack Obama was the usurper, uh, a fringe, relatively, candidate who was taking on the establishment in 2008, which was Hillary Clinton. And the only reason he was competitive, in large part, was his ability to raise money from small donors and aggregate that money. And it was the power of the internet that allowed him to uh, collect lots of small donations and make them into a huge pile and in fact beat her at the fundraising game. Um, if you go from that to the phenomenon a few years ago of the ice bucket challenge <clears throat> that allowed what, what was a, a pretty dreaded uh, disease raise um, raise money in th raise more money in three months than they had done in their entire history um i realized that that the, the the tools of the internet can be also be applied to social justice cases the kickstarter uses the power of the internet <coughs> to aggregate money for the arts and artists and theater and so forth mm -hmm. And, and so my intervention is that we can intervene in human rights and social justice cases by aggregating small amounts of money wherever they are and fund cases that would never have been funded otherwise. I think, I think this allows cases to move forward, cases of torture in Ireland, cases of police brutality in the United States, uh, cases uh, involving migrant labor, uh, uh, where, wherever they happen to be, um, cases of stolen art, Nazi stolen art, or, or African masks that, that need to be uh, restored to their rightful um, owners, from, but people who can't afford uh, to do that. <laughs> um, and so basically it's taking the idea that we can crowdfund social justice and environmental cases. Wow. And so that you're not just dependent on what in England they call a no win, no fee lawyer, or what in the United States they call a contingency attorney. But in fact, you can, you can get money from the crowd to fund your case so that you can, in fact, zealously pursue human rights, social justice, and environmental justice. You, you mentioned uh, Justice Investor early on. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. So why did you? Why did you actually, or when did you actually create that? Well, it came out of a seminar, it came out of exactly a philanthropy in action. I was teaching um, about the ways in which um, people are finding innovative ways to raise funding. Uh -huh. um, there, are, there are ways in which you can get grants from the federal government, there are ways in which you get grants from rich people. There were also. <coughs> ways in which Barack Obama raised money, ways in which the Ice Bucket Challenge raised money. And I realized, since I had been at the NAACP, and we had been struggling, as many organizations struggle annually to, to, to raise its budget, that one of the ways in which we could raise money is through the crowd, reaching out to, the, to that broad audience, that universe of people who are on the inter internet, and get them to support your cause. Um, but, it, but in a very particular way, this is to support legal cases, which mm -hmm. has never been done. 
Um, and it basically was, was, an, was there was a, a moment of clarity when I was thinking about, um, broadly speaking, <clears throat> the way in which Jewish philanthropy historically was about aggregating resources. So if I could just be historic for a second, <clears throat> there's sort of two branches of philanthropy historically. You have sort of Scottish philanthropy, which is like Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Bill Gates, one really wealthy person who is giving away uh, his or her money. And then you have Jewish philanthropy, in which you were about the entire community of people coming together uh, to fund something. And I thought uh, that the modern iteration of this was using the internet to crowdfund, in it, to aggregate money uh, that we can fund justice and social justice and social justice cases. And that's, and that's basically out, out of that scholarship came this idea. Do you remember the first, um, did, 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 you, did you actually put it into effect? Oh, and yes. Oh. Yes. In fact, I created a, a nonprofit in the United States called Justice Investor, and I created a charity in the United Kingdom called Justice Investor. Um, and and the, the, both, are, both are founded and both are working uh, hard uh, to try to um, find cases and to fund cases within the realm of human rights, social justice, and environmental justice. Do you remember the first response to the, the justice investor in the United States, the, the, the first donation? Um, do I remember the first donation? Uh, I, I have to, so, so uh, I remember the first set of donations. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? I, I, I guess let me let me tweak the question a little. What was it like when you got a positive reaction? Well, the, there's certainly a feeling of 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 the idea being vindicated mm. and, and an idea that's found its time. Um, uh, so I'm uh, so I was very excited that um, very very excited that people there was an aha moment for a lot of people. Because you know, you know, one of one of the things about a good idea is how simple it is, and well, what the simplicity of, of this idea was no one had ever done it. <coughs> wow! But, it, but it's so, but it's so simple, and you wonder why has why has no one ever done this before? Um, so I'm happy to be have been, you know, the first person to have uh, thought of it, um, and I believe it's going to work. I believe it's going to be disruptive, and I believe it will finally help balance the scales of justice and give people access who otherwise would never have gotten access to the courts. Whether they're in India, whether they're in the UK, the United States, you know, Kenya, or wherever. I, wanna, I, I, I want to venture into an essay you wrote, New Political and Legal Strategies for African Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it, it pulled me in, and, and I mean, I got, I got, I got really in, in, interested in it. So let me, let me try this. Dreaming big, dreaming creatively. Um, October 4th, 2004. Yes. Among the things you spoke on, I want to zero in on strategies, one of which is go home, all right? Um, Dean, I hope I'm pronouncing this guy right, this person's name right, Dean Guido Calabrisi. Yes. Pleaded with four, with four year students to take their talents back to their original homes when they graduated. Why did that resonate with you? <clears throat> My cohort at Yale Law School uh, was made up of, of just incredibly brilliant uh, young uh, people who would all come from such a diverse uh, set of places uh, in America and around the world. But for the most part, they were all going to be, end they were all ending up in Washington, D.C., New York, San Francisco, L.A., and Chicago. Mm. And, and when you spoke with them, the reason they had all gone to law school was to go back to North Dakota, or to go back to <clears throat> India, or to go back to... Um, New Jersey or some other 
not particularly exciting place. But they were all now excited because they could enter into elite firms and other institutions in major uh, centers of, 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 of the United States or Europe. <clears throat> and, 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 and the truth is, um, your, your comparative advantage is to go to places where you actually came from or where there's an absence of your kind of talent. And so what Guido Calabresi had said to us, and, and I don't think many people took it or not, not, took, took it to heart or took it to heart right then, was <clears throat> you could actually become president um, and ch or, or become a real driving force and a, and a change maker, but hardly if you went to New York, or, uh, but, but, if, but certainly if you went to um, New Jersey or you went to Nebraska or you went to Arkansas like Bill Clinton did. Um, and I think uh, that resonated, that really did resonate with me. Um, and I certainly took it to heart, as, as, as you, you saw from my career. And I would say that I would never have gotten my career <clears throat> had I not gone to some of these small ponds where there was a dire need for talent um, and for someone who had that kind of elite training that I'd had. Wow. Uh, of course, the, their costs, right? You know, it yes, takes for of course. Right. Uh, you don't get a salary, you don't have the community. But it certainly, it was certainly um, worthwhile. I, would, I do want to say that the part of that essay of 2004 uh, that I take even more pride in is that in that essay, I claim that Barack Obama would be the first president of the United you States. Did? Oh, God, I got to go back to that essay. Wow, I missed that sort of thing. And I, so that was, that was way before wow. uh, then... Even he, I don't think Barack was even a senator then. What made you think so at a time? Because I'd met him, and this was the most remarkable, one of the most, you know, I would say the most remarkable human being that I'd met. Um, <coughs> and I felt, I felt, I felt such a, um, a, a passion and a love for this man. Uh, and, and even back then, uh, in 2004, I penned it that he would be the first uh, African-American president. I was right. Wow. Well, congratulations on that. But I, I want to ask you a question that came up when, um, about this comment that this guy, Guido Gal um, Calabresi, said. What, what do you say to the young, the young brilliant, brilliant young mind that is, that is um, arguing against going home? the argument being, well, home might not be ready for me. Let's say a place coming from a, 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 on, the, on the developed or a, a developing nation like Guyana or somewhere in Africa, and they're saying, well, here I just have a, a, one of these elite uh, education. What sense does it make going home when home might not be ready for me? What argument would, how, what would you tell that young um, student if, if, you know, or graduate, sorry, if they had come to you for advice? That the world is never ready for you. <laughs> um, you have to make it ready. I'm going to write this down. The <laughs> world is never ready for you. Wow. Um, and, and, and part of struggle and part of the joy of one's life is not, is, is in fact to say that you had a, a market impact on it or that you created a space or you made something ready that was not ready. I, I, you know, if I were waiting for the NAACP, for example, to have embraced LGBT rights, I would never have joined it before yeah. I joined it. Uh. Um, and so uh, I, I think that what I wanted my students to believe is that they were empowered and gifted in a way to create wherever they went the kind of world and culture that they wanted to live in not to not to seek to just embed themselves where it already existed because then they just wasted all that talent and and and, and training uh so what what i would say is the mark of your talent and and your soul is if you could go to a place and then change it i love it i love it you be the change one of the other strategies, the, the third strategy, draw on the power, I love this one, draw on the power of older women of color. 
How did you remember to factor this population into your overall strategy, Maxim? Because I had a, a lot of older women of color in my life. <laughs> <laughs> One quick question on that point, on that note. Um, how have some of them affected you or helped to mold you into this man you have become? It's, it, it, you know, history has always been his story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a ridiculous story of, of, of this, and it's a false story of the actions of, 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 of men um, as if, you know, that's, that's really what has shaped culture and, and society and so forth. Men, of course, have played a role but I think it's left out <coughs> more than half of the population. And certainly, if you're dealing with a, a post-colonial environment where men, uh, or if you're dealing with America, where, where, where African-American men are incarcerated disproportionately to any other man, um, the, the backbone of these communities have often been women of color and women who kept going uh, in the most oppressive um, circumstances and found tools and strategies to survive. I agree. Um, and I think uh, acknowledging that and acknowledging the sort of sheer talent and strength that these women have, um, these women have, uh, and then adopting that is a lot better than adopting some peacock strategy of, of, of men who keep making the same mistakes. Maxim, in the chat room, Karen asked, what do you think of the role of BLM in the 2016 presidential race? Of, I don't, I, I, so Karen, I don't know what BLM is. All right, let, I, I'm, I'm sure Karen oh, is Black listening. Lives Matter, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh my God. <laughs> uh, uh. Um, I think it is the it is the, it is the most paradigm shifting social movement of, of our time. Mm. Uh, I think we have we've certainly had the paradigm shifting social movement of LGBT rights, the Black Lives the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the fact that the fact that it, it is it has uh, infiltrated every aspect of our society from the Supreme Court uh, to television to people on the street with, with, with an acknowledgement. And again, this goes back to the media with acknowledgement through, through all, all kinds of media that, um, that there continues to be this horrific uh, disparity in the treatment of African-Americans and others vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the majority um, is, is important. And I think, the, you know, you know it's, it's not, a, by the way, I, 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 let me be clear. <clears throat> I don't think this is a new phenomenon. The, the, the new phenomenon is that the technology exists to bring it to light. The, 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 the horrors that people are seeing have been going on for quite a long time. Uh, it's, it's simply that the technology now exists that we can actually uh, get media time to, to show what people have been claiming for, for centuries. And certainly at the NAACP, <clears throat> which had been rec you know, keeping records of abuses for over a century, uh, this is no this is no news. Um, but I think the Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, is a movement that is not going away. And I, I was just thrilled uh, to read actually today of a judge, um, um, a federal judge, and actually it was a George H. W. Bush appointed judge. Uh, uh, reprimanding the Seattle Police Union and saying to them, uh, "Black Lives Matter," when the, the the Seattle Police Union was trying to continue unconstitutional behaviors if they did not get higher uh, salaries and and benefits, it's outrageous to think that you you think it's it's, it's negotiable to continue to continue you know. Uh, bad actions because you're not getting what you think should be your 
more benefits and a higher salary. It's on it's constitutional. It's on constitutional. You 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 stop it immediately. Uh, so the fact that that we are we are hearing Glenn Beck <laughs> of all people um, tells me that it it it, ha it has reached if not its apex, it certainly reached that point of of, of crossover appeal. What are your deep concerns and fears about justice, the LGBT community and the black community? Well, my fear is, is about any group mm -hmm. that, that achieves something that it, it's wanted to achieve and then disappears from the, from the movement. My, my, my greatest fear, <clears throat> um, but I don't see it happening, by the way, would, would have been if LGBT people having achieved marriage <coughs> suddenly walked away from the broader social movements of class <coughs> and racial justice and economic justice um, that we continue to struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, for all the wrong reasons, we can, we can thank the Republicans, Donald Trump and others, because his crass sexism, bigotry, xenophobia, etc., cetera, um, make it clear that these, move, these movements are connected. And, and so to the extent that um, someone might have achieved one victory doesn't mean that you don't continue to fight for other people's victories. When are you most happy, Maxim? When am I or why am I? When are you most happy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy all the time, actually. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, challenges uh -huh. going on right now, uh, and the worst thing to me is is if you if you let people win by being unhappy. If 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 you are, if, if they get in your head and make you depressed and make you um, unhappy, they have won. Love it. Love uh, this. Uh, I'm, I, I'm incredibly happy and joyful because uh, they don't have my mind. I have my own mind, and, and, and they don't have my student's mind. Uh, I'm able to, to, to affect my student's mind, uh, in, hopefully in, in, a really, in a really good way. So I, I feel I'm, I'm happy, I'm subversive, and... Uh, and disruptive, too. I'm disruptive, <laughs> and I'm doing my part. So what else can I ask for? If you could go back in time. What would you tell that 15-year-old boy? Well, um, <clears throat> that 15... <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it's so funny. That 15-year-old boy, boy is, so, is, is in me still, but so different. Uh -huh. um, that 15-year-old boy was so busy trying to... I don't think he was trying to fit in, but he was trying to, um, to say something I said earlier. He was trying to assume an identity that wasn't his. Um, and I would, I, would, I would tell him that uh, the only identity he should ever want to assume is his own. Oh. Oh. What makes you laugh out loud, Maxim? <laughs> you, you just did. Uh, um, I, think, uh, I think when I hear um, the, the sort of humorous... Um, uh, rhetoric passing as political argument from people like Donald Trump. It makes me laugh out loud. It doesn't make me <coughs> not consider it dangerous, because it is, but it makes me realize <coughs> that someone is giving voice to all of those unstated things that some people have been thinking and doing for a long time. And in many ways, um, the articulation of that kind of arrogance and hate and hatefulness uh, allows us to uh, grapple with it in a very direct way. Um, being able to grapple with things should make us happy. Uh, um, be, 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 I'm, I'm, and by the way, I'm in, I'm in no way encouraging or endorsing uh, hateful language and speech. Uh, but it is, it is hysterically funny that the Republican Party and, and, and folks of that nature uh, 
are now being captured um, on film everywhere, spouting the kind of ignorance that, that we are seeing uh, today. Maxim, I, I, I'm going to go to the chat room for a bit, and I'm going to beg you for a minute or two, because there, there are two strategies that I find very important I really want to ask you about. And I mean, you can be quick about it. Anyway, Karen asked, uh, many act said, many activists with the BLM, BLM movement are LGBTQ. How does this square with the perceived homophobia within the community? Well, uh, so I think it's, I think, I think it's, this, this is one of the <coughs> um, history repeating itself. And, and, and so I'm so glad Karen asked that question. Because Julian Bond would say, history hasn't changed. The reason we got to the Civil Rights March on Washington was because of LGBT people. If it wasn't for, one of Julian's jokes before he died was that Martin Luther King, he would say, could not organize vampires to a bloodbath. <laughs> uh, he was an amazing orator, orator and he had other kinds of skills, but he's certainly not an organizer. Uh, Bayard Rustin, on the other hand, a gay man, uh, was. <clears throat> and, you know, you know the, the women and the lesbians and others behind the Black Lives Movement is just a continuation of the tradition in which uh, LGBT people have anchored many movements over centuries. They just haven't been acknowledged uh, for, for, for doing that. Um, I, I think that, uh, Karen, the, the perception people... People are, are using the, uh, or, or, or how, how should I put this? People are getting some sort of currency out of the perception that uh, there, is, there is homophobia and other kinds of problems within, within black movements. And certainly there, there are some of that, but it's certainly not the way that people want to use it to divide us. Mm. I, th I think there was a time, let's say in the George W, uh, Bush time with the Karl Rove politics, <laughs> that these things were wedge, wedge issues and wedge issues in, the, in, in, in certain communities. I, I would argue today that's, that it's almost, uh, that is laughable. Um, uh, gay marriage is not a wedge issue uh, today in, in our politics. Um, and, and, uh, and part of that is the NAACP's movement on it. Part of that is, is just many other people's movement on it. So, um, I think the Black, Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement is astounding for, for keeping racial justice as its core, but also keeping uh, LGBT people as, as, its, as some of its key leadership and informing in a cross-pollinating way strategies from both the civil rights movement and the LGBT rights movement together in this new movement. Um, the sixth strategy is, as I asked you, right? Ally with the gay community. But what really drew my attention was the comment that it's far too late in the day for blacks to be homophobic or anti-Semitic, for that matter. We cannot afford to lose natural allies based on the same kind of irrational, noxious prejudices we ourselves have fought for so long. How close to a personal compass is your list of seven strategies? Maxim. I, I'm so sorry I don't have time to ask you about the, the, the networking your, your heart out because I think that is very, very important. But back to this. How, how close to a personal compass is this? Uh, in, uh, very close. Mm. Um, um, <clears throat> I, I don't want to say that the seven strategies are just, you know, w words that Maxim lives by. Uh, but I do think that what you just read is is part of all of our DNA, your DNA, my DNA, uh, Karen's DNA, and, and any of our other listeners. Um, it is black people of all people uh, can't afford to be prejudiced. Mm. I think I think any any of the colonized world, uh, it's ludicrous to think of us uh, or any of us as as embodying a kind of of, of, of prejudice, homophobia. Uh, things that we inherited from the Victorian era and so forth. It's, it's, um, we, ex we know what it's like to have centuries of oppression, um, pigmentation, uh, ludicrously having meanings that make no sense. Um, and so, you know, 
choosing to love who you want to love uh, as, 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 a, as a marker of, of personal worth is, is ridiculous. Um, and so if, of all people, we should, and we have to be, and we are, I think, uh, much more welcoming and progressive and tolerant of difference because we understand that difference is what makes us uh, stronger. It's, it's what makes the world beautiful. It's what makes us beautiful. And, and without that, then we question our own identity and our, and our own sense of self. Maxim, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. I'm <laughs> delighted to have, uh, you know, it's a, I think it's 105 where I am at the moment. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, you, you're a real trooper without a single complaint. Look, let me let you get off this, this um, camera for uh, as quickly as possible. But, but thank you very much, Maxim. Thank you for your time. You've been generous and very gracious. So thanks. You're very welcome. And thanks, Karen, and everyone else who tuned in. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.